coming up on this episode. Say for instance, well, I'm back when I was in high school and in college and I started to pray and I had, I played on a softball team for a while and say we had a game coming up and I really wanted to be able to play. I didn't want it to be rained out. So I would pray, oh Lord, please don't let it rain. Don't let it rain here today. Please, please don't let it rain. But some of these baseball fields, softball fields that we played in, were uh, cut out of large sections where there were uh, cornfields all around. This was in Illinois, and there were cornfields all around. Maybe that farmer is praying that very same day, oh God, please give us rain, because I need rain for my crops. We haven't had rain in a while. You see how these two prayers over the same area can conflict? My prayer was a selfish prayer, where he is praying for the grain and basically to feed the community. That's what this is talking about. Hi, welcome to Evidence for Faith. It's your host, Michael Lane. So glad you're joining me in this lesson today as we continue in our series on the basics of Christian living. And this lesson is a very important one because it's all about prayer. Why do we pray? What is prayer? Why prayer? Tell me what it is. And so, and I've had people ask me questions like that. So that's what we're going to focus on today. And it seems appropriate if we're going to do that, that, you know, we should, we should go to the Lord in prayer first to start with, right? So if you'll just bear with me for a minute here as we go into prayer. Father God, we ask that you would just bless this lesson, bless this time. And for all those who are listening, Lord, that you would open up the hearts of them and their minds to be able to take this. And Lord, not just listen to the words I'm saying, but to apply them through their life, to draw closer to you, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So what is prayer? Well, let me tell you a story. Back when the earth was cooling and I was in high school, I got a part-time job working at a uh, local grocery store. And I worked after school, and I worked on Saturdays. Sundays we had off, the store owner closed the store on Sunday. Primarily my job was to overlook and oversee people who were bagging groceries and bag groceries myself. There at the registers, and um, we would bag these things up, but we did something besides bagging that not many places do. We would carry them and put them on carts and stuff, and we would carry them out into the parking lot to put them into the cars or the vehicles of the people who purchased the, the groceries. We were not allowed to take tips. This was something that the owner did unique with the store, as a thank you for shopping with them. That was what this was all about. And sometimes in doing this type of thing, working in grocery stores, sometimes like for instance on a Saturday, man, we were busier than a one arm paper hanger. We just had so many people coming in because they got their paychecks and now they're buying their groceries on Saturday. They're off from work, so they would do that. Other times during the week, <laughs> it was so boring. I remember working on Wednesday nights, like from six to nine, that, that span of time right there, hardly anybody seemed to come in. If they did come into the grocery store, there'd only be a few of us working, but if they did come in, they would make small purchases and they would basically just carry the package out themselves. It was very little for us to do, but the owner was really nice. This is when we could do some of our homework in between things like this. He allowed to do the, us to do that, and that was really sweet of him. Now, the reason I'm telling you this story is because I learned something while working at the store that really impacted my life from that point on. Totally changed an aspect of my life. You see, where I told you, we're at this area where we're doing the checkout. There's the registers there and the counters and the groceries come down in the conveyor belts and we would bag them. But right behind where we are standing, up on the wall behind us, there was a large frame dictum. Um, or a pronouncement, if you will, not a picture, it was a, a dictum, and it was displayed where everybody in the store could see this, and that's why it was put there. So everybody, as they come out, they see this. And it was really interesting. The words of it were just etched into my brain because I saw this all the time, every day at work, every day coming in, and every customer who ever came in. Now, what this dictum read, it says this on this. Prayer, our most powerful weapon and the one we use the least. That's what it said on that. So every day as I'm standing there, or if it was boring and I'm looking, you can't help but see this. And this really got me going because for me, I began to study prayer and see what it was. Pull, checked out books, bought books on prayer, and started to see how 
what prayer is and how to use it. And it changed my entire way to this day of how I pray. I discovered a mystery about prayer um, that I'm going to share with you today. It's really not a mystery, but I discovered a lot about this mystery of prayer. And I began to, to read my Bible and study my Bible more. And um, I was looking and searching for God's perspective. And this is the key to look for God's perspective on prayer. That's what this was all about. So what is prayer? Well, we know it's something we're supposed to do. I think everybody will agree with that. It is something we're supposed to do. And it's spoken of in such great detail in both the Old and the New Covenants of the Bible. The Bible is full of prayers um, all the way through it, from the beginning to the end. You'll see it in both covenants here. The disciples knew about it. John the Baptist, we're told, he taught his disciples how to pray. Likewise, a disciple comes to Jesus and asks the Lord to teach them to pray. To pray, And in Luke 11, verse 1, we read, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. What is this mystery? What is this engagement? Because they were searching, the disciples searching. What was it that they wanted to know? And we know it's important because Paul frequently wrote about prayer and, and that Christians should be praying um, and praying without ceasing. Matter of fact, in, in many verses, 1 Thessalonians um, chapter 5, verse 16 through 18, we read, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Ephesians chapter 6 Verse 16 through 18 reads, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Also, we find it in Romans chapter 12, verse 12. We read, Rejoice in hope, be patient, in tribulation, be constant in prayer. I'm going to repeat that one because this is a good motto or verse to read and, and implement into your mind or make a, a little sign someplace in your house or something. This is, this is a great one. It's Romans 12, 12. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. In this series on the basics of Christian living, uh, we've been covering the foundation stones on how to live a life for Christ, how to live for Christ in this present age. Prayer is one of these, and it's one of the most important stones in the whole building of this. It is so important that it is very difficult to grow spiritually with this stone missing. I have stated over and over that to grow spiritually, one must communicate with God. Communication is performed by speaking with God and by listening to God. Speaking to God is what we call prayer, and that's what this lesson is all about. The next lesson, and which will be the final lesson in this series, is about listening to God. Both of these two stones, the, the speaking and the listening, both of these two stones are so foundational and vital for Christian growth. Though I do believe that of the two of them, one is more important. I think listening to God probably is more important because to listen to God helps you to know God. And how can you talk to God if you don't know who God is? So we'll get into that one though, um, about listening to God, which is literally reading his 66 love letters to us. We'll get into that in the, the next lesson, which will be the final one. Let's get back to prayer though. Prayer is a topic that is covered, as I said, extensively in the Bible, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, prayer and praying are mentioned 1,171 times in the Bible. That many times, you know it's got to be important. The Jews, who the Bible, the Old Covenant was written to in particular, and even the New Covenant, which was <laughs> written by, mostly by Jews too, Jews were quite familiar with prayer. Um, and the form of prayer, and what prayer was in communicating um, with God. 
They were so familiar with it. And the disciples, being Jewish also, frequently saw Jesus praying to his father. So they saw this firsthand. It reads in, in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, we read, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. The disciples, being Jewish, grew up with a Jewish perspective of prayer. And these New Testament writers, Paul, John, Mark, these are Jews also. They grew up knowing the Jewish perspective of prayer. This means that they all knew that they had a right to pray to God. It was a huge part of their synagogue services, and they believed also that God heard their prayers. How do we know this? Because in Psalm 65, verse 2, we read, O you who hear prayer. They're speaking of God. God, O oh God, you hear our prayers, is basically what is being said here. Because of this, they would not badger God with prayers like the pagans would. I mean, most of them, if they're doing it correctly. Um, pagans would continually recite and, and scream their prayers over and over and over. For instance, we get a great example of this um, in the Old Covenant in the book of 1 Kings chapter 18. It's when we have the prophets of Baal going against Elijah at Mount Carmel. Let's read part of that right now and see how this goes. And check out what the pagans, how they are praying. That's what we want to focus on. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we're going to start at verse 26 and go through 29. And here's how it reads. And they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it, and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made, and they cried aloud, and cut themselves after their, after their custom with swords and lances until blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on and on until the time of the offering of the oblation. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. That's how pagans prayed. Now, even Jesus addressed this showy way of praying. In Matthew 6, verse 5, we read, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. Hmm. Showy prayers, screaming and stuff, putting on a show, that's not the way you pray. Let's go back to this passage in 1 Kings. And now notice how Elijah prays compared to them. And it reads, and again, we're picking up 1 Kings 18, starting now at verse 36 and going through 37. And it reads, at that time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. And I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, that you have turned their hearts back. I need to notice what's going on. Elijah simply talked to God. He's not shouting. He's not screaming or anything. He simply talked to God. He didn't shout, didn't dance around the altar, didn't do anything. He simply talked with God. Going back to the, to the ancient Hebrew word that is used here, where it says Elijah said, it's the word Omar. And Omar means to simply just speak like I'm doing to you right now. That's what Elijah did. Jesus taught his disciples about prayer also. In Matthew chapter 6, a very familiar passage for everybody, basically, um, having to do with the Lord prayer. But look what he said next as he's in here. In Matthew 6, 6, it, Jesus tells us as he's teaching them about to pray, but when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, when Jesus said this in the first century, Jewish homes were very small, quite confined, not big, massive rooms like we have today. Little privacy existed for families. Notice that 
their prayers were not made just in the temple or in the synagogue or at certain gatherings. You see, you don't have to go to places like this to pray. Jesus was telling him, you can perform prayers right in the quietness of your own home. Now, let's, since this is a, a Jewish perspective, let's go back to the Jewish Talmud. And the Jewish Talmud has many things written about prayer. There's quite a few lessons that we see here. The Talmud, the ancient Jewish book of teachings, taught that prayers were to be constant. Yes, constant, just like what Paul wrote, constant, and not out of desperation, as too many people today don't pray until the disaster befalls them. Then all of a sudden they start praying to God. Now, there were certain elements that the Jews taught concerning prayer, and Jesus, being a rabbi, he incorporated many of these things that are right there in the Talmud. He incorporated many of these, even as he's teaching his disciples and, and teaching them the Lord's Prayer. Let me tell you a few, eight specific things that the Talmud teaches the Jews about prayer, and you're going to see how these were picked up by Jesus and by the uh, apostles afterwards. Number one, Prayer should incorporate love and praise to God. Very simple. Part of your prayer should be praising God. Number two, prayer should incorporate gratitude and thanksgiving. Okay, besides praising God and loving God, be thankful and gracious to God. See, this is not that far off from what Jesus is teaching. He's, it's the same thing. Number three, prayer should acknowledge God's holiness. We see this in the Lord's Prayer, and we see this in the Talmud, that we should be doing this type of prayer. So this is totally correct. The fourth point, prayer should express a desire to obey God. That's what you should see in prayer also. Number five, prayer should incorporate confession of sins. Hmm, confessions of sins in our prayer. On that point, there is an old rabbinic saying that was, if you can bring nothing else to God, bring him your tears, and he will hear. We're talking about the confession of sins. Hmm. If you don't know what to say, God understands tears. Number six, prayer must be unselfish and for others. Oh, wow, that's different. This is interesting because... Praying today for most people, praying for personal blessings might interfere with another person's plans. The Jews caught this. They understood that if you prayed, if they were to pray for a specific thing, it might hinder one of the other members of the community. Now, if I've lost you on that, let me explain it this way. Say, for instance, well, I'm back when I was in high school or in college and I started to pray, and I had, I played on a softball team for a while and say we had a game coming up and I really wanted to be able to play. I didn't want it to be rained out. So I would pray, oh Lord, please don't let it rain. Don't let it rain here today. Please, please don't let it rain. But some of these baseball fields, softball fields that we played in were uh, cut out of large sections where there were uh, cornfields all around. This was in Illinois and there were cornfields all around. Maybe that farmer is praying that very same day, oh God, please give us rain because I need rain for my cross. We haven't had rain in a while. You see how these two prayers over the same area can conflict? My prayer was a selfish prayer where he is praying for the grain and basically to feed the community. That's what this is talking about. So, Jews prayed for everybody, including themselves. Not specifically like we do today, where we go to God with the shopping list, I want this, I want this, I want this. Mm -mm. Number seven, prayer should be constant mindset. Yeah, constant mindset all day long. Well, we're going to see this in the, the New Covenant. Actually, we've already covered some of these verses where Paul is saying, pray without ceasing. So we see this. And the eighth one, and the final one here, prayers should be offered in humility because God hates the proud. God hates the proud. Jesus often reprimanded people um, because they were prideful. God hates human pride. I'm going to give you a quote that I was reading years ago uh, about prayer that John MacArthur said that sort of stuck with me and I wrote this down and I, I thought this was really good. John MacArthur wrote, quote, prayer is never an attempt to bend the will of God to my desire. Prayer is to bend my desire 
to fit the will of God. That's so important, I'm going to repeat that. Prayer is never an attempt to bend the will of God to my desire. Prayer is to bend my desire to fit the will of God. We see Jesus do this. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 29, on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus went and he prayed what? And going a little farther, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You see, these were the rules and instructions for a humble, pious Jew when it comes to prayer. And Jesus, being a rabbi, he, had, he knew these things, and plus he's God, he knows all things, and he is basically saying the same thing, that um, the humble and the pious Jew does it this way. He also gave us, Jesus gave us an outline to pray. We call this the Lord's Prayer. It is an outline. When the disciples come and ask him, hey, teach us to pray, um, Jesus gives this instruction. And apparently this is done more than one time in his ministry. In Luke chapter 11, when Jesus is asked by his disciples to give them a lesson on prayer, he repeats an earlier lesson that is taught from Matthew's gospel. Now, most scholars do believe that these are two separate instances. Um, anyway, this is where we get the Lord's Prayer. Now, one thing I find very interesting about the Lord's Prayer is the instructions Jesus gives about prayers in general, because it is. It's an outline on how to pray. He did not say to make them repetitive. Did you notice that? The disciples say, Jesus, teach us to pray. Well, say this line, just keep repeating it over and over. He doesn't say that. He didn't say to make them ritualistic. But this is exactly what has happened in many churches today, particularly certain denominations. They just repeat the prayer. Every single Sunday, they repeat the same prayer, repeat the same prayer, repeat the same prayer. It gets to the point that people are just doing it out of rote memorization without even thinking about what they're saying. Jesus says, you don't do that. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, we read, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what your needs are before you ask. You see, Gentiles and pagans, um, they would recite their prayers, shouting, screaming, them, et cetera, et cetera, but they would do this over and over and over, and to the point that it really became meaningless. They're just reciting things from rote, uh, rote memory. Jesus was telling his disciples, hey, you don't do it that way. That's not what it was even in the Talmud. You don't do it that way. He's telling them not to pray like Gentiles, who would pray repetitively over and over saying their prayers. Now, let's look at the Lord's Prayer and see this simple yet beautiful outline he gives us and what this prayer is all about. In Matthew chapter 6, we're going to go here now, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, we're going to read, and most of you probably know this and can do it easily yourselves. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, there are many ways to look at this prayer and we could study this for a long time. This prayer is in two components. The first three parts deal with God, and the second three parts deal with man's need. There's a lesson here. When we pray, we should focus first upon God, then focus on man's needs. We see that as an example from this prayer. Another feature is how the first half of this is set in three purposes. It was to honor God was the first thing, the second was to bring in the kingdom of God. And the third, that God's will be done. The next feature is how God is glorified by three things. Giving us our daily bread. Pardoning our sins. He gets glory from that. And protecting us from temptation. These three acts bring glory to God. Another way of observing this prayer is that the first half obviously deals 
with praising God, and the second half is dealing with man. You should be able to see this very easily. But notice that in the second half, the words and how they're put, it says to give us, forgive us, deliver us. Now, did you catch this? Do you notice it's the word us? Us. It's plural. Every one of these is plural. It's not I. It's not me. It's plural. Remember I told you that the Jews were taught to pray community. This also just we, we sort of mess up prayer so many times because we focus on just us. But here, we see it's more than us. It's, this was written in the plural. There's a word of caution here in verse 12 of the Lord's Prayer. And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Or in some translations, it'll read, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The word trespass doesn't mean going on somebody's property. It means sin. Now, do you really want God to forgive you of your sins the same way that you actually forgive other people when they sin against you? Do you know that's what you're praying when you pray that? I want God to forgive me the same way I forgive other people when they do things wrong against me. I pray God does a better job than I do. <laughs> I, that's a scary part to that prayer. I, whenever people say, let's pray the Lord's Prayer, I, I'm all for the beginning of them. When I get to that part there, boy, I'm a little cautious. I mean, we're supposed to be like that. We are. We're supposed to forgive like God. Um, and that's difficult for us, though. But let us all try with earnest, um, earnestness to do this, to forgive like God. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And by doing it, it brings glory to God. It's a scary part, but it's an important part of that prayer. There is so much more I would love to teach you about this prayer, but time doesn't allow. Let me finish with just five basic thoughts and teachings on prayer. Really simple, five things. Number one, prayer should not be a last resort when things go wrong in our lives. Now, there is an ancient Jewish saying, before misfortune comes, anticipate and pray. Sort of reminds me of what my dad's motto was, always expect the unexpected. But it was a Jewish saying, before misfortune comes, anticipate and pray. Mm, that's important. A second point I want to leave you with. Talk to God when you study your Bible. The Spirit is there with you. He's right there wanting to teach you. So as you read through this, pray to him and talk to him as you're reading your Bible. Oh, God, that was cool. God, why'd you do that? Or, God, can I apply this part to my life? A third point I want to leave you. Be in the mindset of the Holy Spirit is with you all the time. So talk to him all the time, as you would your best friend. That means wherever you go, wherever you're at, talk to him. You don't have to talk out loud. You can talk to him mentally. He can hear your thoughts. So when you're at at work, remember, Holy Spirit's there. Talk to him. If you're at school, he's there. Even if you're out playing in a field and playing games, or if you're doing some other form of entertainment, he's there. Talk to him. In the living room of your house, he's there. In the bathroom, he's there. In your bedroom, he's there. You can't shut him out. You can't take the Holy Spirit and push him out if you're a born-again Christian. He's right there with you all the time. So talk to him. He's your best friend. Fourth, if you think the prayer is just for you, <laughs> you've missed the whole point of prayer. As the Jews, and as we've talked about here, and even Jesus said, you don't basically pray for yourself. You pray for others. The fifth point I want to leave you with is something I read in a book written by a um, famous British doctor. He was also a minister. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones. He wrote a book on teaching and prayer, and in this book he wrote this. Man is at his greatest and highest when upon his knees he comes face to face with God. I got to repeat that. Man is at his greatest and highest when upon his knees he comes face to face with God. That sort of stuck with me too.
as I studied prayer over these years. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you get something out of this. I hope this helps you in your walk with Christ and in your spiritual growth, because this is a major part of spiritual growth, is talking to God. Father God, I thank you for this time we have and this lesson. I thank you for your word and for Jesus coming. I thank you for pardoning our sins because you are a great and holy God. You are awesome in power and might beyond our comprehension, yet you love us. And we pray, Lord, that you do help us as we go through the day to live lives according to you and to think of others more than we think of ourselves. And Lord, help us when we come into areas where we're going to be tempted. Please protect us and help us with this. We ask that you always receive the praise. And Lord, we ask to help me to know what I can do for you. In Jesus' glorious name and for his kingdom, we pray. Amen. Thanks a lot. And until we meet again, take care and may God bless. Support the show. Become a donor at evidenceforfaith.org give. 